Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's class, which is called Determining Basis in Employee Stock Options. And this is actually a topic I like because I figured it out. I figured out this rat's nest of information a number of years ago out of necessity because our office, located in northwest Portland, Oregon, is very close to the big Intel campus, and Intel likes to give stock options to its employees, and those employees like to come have us do their tax returns. So much of the information compiled into today's class is just based on my years of deciphering Intel documents and turning them into tax returns. We're going to actually look at some more information on the sale of stock options in a course that I'm teaching next week on sale of assets. So today is really not going to be focusing on the sales of these assets, really rather figuring out what the basis in those assets is. But we will, just by necessity, be showing how basis adjustments are entered on a Schedule D and on Form 8949. So I'm going to move on down to page two of the manual where we're going to begin with an introduction. And those of you who are with me this morning, you'll see a brief overlap between this introduction and what we had covered in this morning's class. But those of you who are joining us for the first time now, we do need to give you this introduction. So let's begin with the concept of basis. And basis is the amount of after-tax cost or investment you have in property for tax purposes. The basis of property is used to figure your gain or loss on the sale of the property. If you sell a capital asset, then the sale of that asset generally is reported on Form 8949 and then on Schedule D if it is held for investment or personal use. If it is held for business use, it goes on Form 4797. We cover that next week in another class called Sale of Business Assets. Firstly, with basis of stock. You calculate your basis in stock the same way that you calculate your basis in other property. However, the sale or disposition of stock is often subject to special treatment, so it is important to be aware of some of the rules affecting the sale of stock. The most confusing aspect for many people is determining the acquisition date and the price of the stock, but how you acquired the stock is the first step in solving the problem. And possible methods for acquiring stock include purchase, gift, inheritance, divorce, employee incentive stock option plans, employee stock purchase plans, and employee stock awards, and restricted stock units. Now, earlier today in class, we spent some time talking about gift and inheritance in figuring your basis in stock. So we're not going to be covering those really at all this afternoon. Today, we're going to be focusing on these last three bullet points, and we're going to be spending a good amount of time on each of these categories. So hopefully by the time we're done with today's class, if nothing better, <laughs> you at least really understand the differences between incentive stock options, employee stock purchase plans, and restricted stock. We will briefly cover the purchase of stock and then jump right into employee stock. So let's move on to the purchase of stock. If you purchase stock, you should keep accurate records of purchase dates and the number of shares of each kind of stock you bought. And of course, that's the nemesis of many clients. They don't keep those records. They don't understand the relevance of those records. A lot of people feel it's a bunch of paper that's taking up space. Why do they need to keep it? They shred it. They get paranoid about ID theft and just dispose of these documents. And then somehow <laughs> they get selected for an audit when they have nothing because they didn't keep it. And we're left with that. But most investment companies do keep computerized records of transactions, and with any luck, even if your client hasn't maintained it, you can go back to the broker and ask for this information. Now, until basis reporting requirements were introduced by the IRS in 2011, basis information frequently was not transferred if you switched investment company. However, it is now common that they are transferred, but it doesn't necessarily mean that the basis reported will be correct. You should keep all records of your stock purchases from the date you purchased the stock until three years after you sell the stock. Be especially sure to keep records of any stock splits or spinoffs that might occur when you hold the stock. If you purchased your stock through an employee stock option plan, you should also maintain copies of the following documents to show your basis in the stock. And actually, I've just been thinking that despite all the time I've put in today's classes, I didn't really take the time in either of them to do some illustrations about spinoffs, and I feel like I'm remiss if I don't do that. So I'm just going to make up an illustration here of a split, just because I know you're going to get quiz questions on it. And although I tell you what to do, I haven't really shown you what to do. Sally buys 100 shares of Intel at $100 a share. And then Intel has a two-for-one split. And that means that instead of having 100 shares, she now has 100 times two, or 200 shares. 
But what that does for her cost basis in the shares that she has is now she's got 200 shares instead of 100 shares, but the total cost of her shares is the same. So if we say that the starting price on the 100 shares she bought was $100 a share, so instead of having 100 shares at $100 each, she now has 200 shares at $50 each. So that's how a slit works. A spinoff is something a little more complicated. Let's suppose you have... 100 shares of XYZ company with a cost of $100 per share. And there is a spinoff of XYZ. XYZ essentially decides to have a baby. (laughs) When XYZ has a baby, that baby becomes a separate entity, and we're going to call that ABC company. And under the valuation purposes of the spinoff, it's established that ABC company is going to take 40% of the value of the company. So 40% of the value of the company is going to be 40% of $100 per share, which means that the cost that's going to transfer from the original XYZ company is going to be $40. So that means that the basis in ABC will now be $40 per share. And then that would mean that the remaining residual basis in XYZ is going to equal $60 per share. So... You're still going to own 100 shares of XYZ company, but those 100 shares are now going to have a basis of $60 a share on them. And you're now also going to own 100 shares of ABC company, and your cost per share in ABC company will be $40 per share. As I said, there was a period of time where I was seeing spinoffs all the time, and then I haven't really seen many of them in a long time. The opposite of a spinoff is a merger. A merger would happen is let's just say ABC and XYZ go on for a few years, And ABC and XYZ decide to merge. As a result of the merger, ABC disappears and all we're left with is XYZ. It isn't usually that simple. They usually spin off to something else and then something else merges with something else and it's not this clear cut. But the opposite would happen in a merger. So if you had a merger of ABC and XYZ and your cost per share in ABC was $40 $40 per share, and your cost per share in XYZ was $60 a share, and after the merger, you have only XYZ shares left, then you would take the 40 per share of ABC plus the 60 per share of XYZ, and you're back up to $100 per share again. So that's what happens in split spinoffs and mergers. And if you want to know whether a split a spinoff or a merger has occurred, sometimes it's pretty public. You've heard about it in the news and you're aware it's going on. Sometimes the client is going to come in with paperwork and you're sitting there looking at the paperwork and it says, oh, there, there was a spinoff. How nice. And there'll be all of these pages and pages of information explaining to you what this particular employee or this particular shareholder now owns as a result of the spinoff. And all of that information clearly is relevant and needs to be used for figuring basis from that point forward. Now, with any luck, a brokerage firm would account for all of that in its basis calculations and save you the trouble. (laughs) But still, this is what is going on in the background, and that's what those terms mean. Okay, so back where we were with maintaining records for employee stock option plans. You should keep all records of your stock purchases from the date you purchase the stock until three years after you sell the stock. And the reason for that is it could be that you purchased the stock back in, I don't know, 1992, and you don't sell it until 2015. Well, 1992 is a long time ago. As we sit here right now, that's 23 years ago, and you're saying I need to keep it for another three years after I sell it. A lot of people just have a hard time comprehending why they have to do it that long, but you do. And if you purchased your stock through an employee stock option plan, you should also maintain copies of the following documents to show your basis in the stock that you purchased, including pay stubs showing gross ups for employee stock purchase plan or ESPP discounts, restricted stock unit awards, and non-qualified options or NQO sales. Advice of sale or similar documents issued to you which show you your purchase price after discounts and any gross ups to wage amounts that were paid. Brokerage statements showing purchase dates and prices paid. Form 3921, exercise of an incentive stock option under Section 422B, as well as Form 3922, transfer of stock acquired through an employee stock purchase plan under Section 423C. 
So we're going to be spending quite a bit of time talking about employee stock purchase plans because these are the most common thing I'm seeing these days. This other item up here, exercise of an ISO under 422B, that's a much less common animal. Really what you need to be knowing is how to deal with these ESPPs and these NQOs up here and then also RSUs. So today what I see commonly are RSUs, NQOs, and ESPPs and I rarely see these ISOs, these qualified ISOs. Basis reporting on Form 1099-B. We have a 1099-B that was updated in 2011 to show basis reporting. It was given boxes in, beginning in 2011 to show basis. There was a redesign for 2012. 1099B for 2012 and 13 looked relatively the same. And then in 2014, the entire form was rearranged again. And the reason it was rearranged was so that these box numbers on the 1099B now correspond to the line numbers on 8949. So on form 8949, line 1A, you would enter the description of the stock that was sold. And on line 1B, you would enter the date acquired. And line 1E, you would enter the cost or the basis. So there's a correlation now between 1099B and 8949 in that the line numbers now match the box numbers, and that was the purpose of the redesign. Another very important thing that came out in 2014 is that the IRS now states that the basis reported in box one shall not include any gross up that was included in an employee's pay that would serve to increase their basis in stock. So I'm going to get into this in a detail on how we determine basis in grossed up stock. But just to suffice it to say that if you purchase stock as an employee and you're able to purchase it at $10 a share when the fair market value is $15 a share, the difference between what you pay and the fair market value by law is compensation, is wage income to you. And you have to include that as wage income and pay tax on it. Well, once you've paid tax on $5, that $5 becomes part of your cost in that stock. But what the IRS instructions are saying, beginning in 2014, so this is not true for 13 and earlier years, but beginning with 14, the gross up amount that increases the basis you have in your stock is not going to be added to box one. So in effect, what that means is that anytime you're dealing with employee stock purchase plan shares, the basis reported in box one is wrong, and it's wrong on purpose. <laughs> so this means that whenever you're looking at a 1099B, and you know that you're working with incentive stock options or actually the NQOs or the ESPPs, that you're going to have to be getting additional documentation from your clients so that you can make adjustments to basis. So 1099B, the two big changes for 2014 and future years are that the boxes now match the line numbers on Form 8949, and in addition, the basis shown in Box 1 will not include any gross-up to wage income as a result of exercise of incentive stock options or um, employee stock purchase plans. So let's talk about employee stock options. Well, there are three different kinds of stock options. There are incentive stock options, referred to as ISOs. There are employee stock purchase plans, which are ESPP options. And then there are also non-statutory or non-qualified stock options, which are NQOs. Within the category of statutory stock options, there are usually two kinds that we're concerned with. One is incentive stock options, and the other is options granted under an employee stock purchase plan. ISOs are relatively uncommon today when compared to non-statutory, non-qualified stock options, the NQOs, and the ESPPs. However, employees who purchase and sell statutory stock options may be given special tax treatment. To qualify for special tax treatment under the rules for statutory stock option plans, both of the following rules must be met. You must be an employee of the company or a related company granting the option from the time the option is granted until three months before the exercise of the option. And in addition, the option must be non-transferable except at death. So we're going to look at incentive stock options first, and these are the less common animal. Now, back in the 90s, they were really common, and they were really popular, start, especially in the high-tech industry. These high-tech companies were starting up, and people were being promised big pay, and they were being awarded these incentive stock options, and they were causing a few nightmares for them, especially when we, the dot com era became what we, we now know of as the dot gone era, and people lost their shirts. 
But there are still a few people out there who have these ISOs going on. And in fact, I have a client that's come to me in the last couple of years, and he is routinely recording income from the sale of incentive stock options on his tax return. So although they're relatively common, there are still people out there who have them. Now, if you received a statutory stock option, you will not include the value of the option in your income at the time the option is granted or when it's exercised. You should note, however, that the exercise of an incentive stock option may subject you to alternative minimum tax. Generally, you will report any gain from the sale of an ISO stock on Schedule D, and your basis in ISO stock is the amount that you paid for the stock when you exercised your option to buy. Your holding period for ISO stock begins on the day you exercise your option and acquire the stock. So let's look here at Form 3929, Exercise of an Incentive Stock Option under Section 422B. If a corporation transfers stock to an employee other than an employee who is a non-resident alien pursuant to that employee's exercise of an incentive stock option described in Section 42B, then for that calendar year, the employer must issue Form 3921 for each transfer that was made during that year. Now, the purpose of Form 3921 is to help you figure any adjustment for incentive stock options that you will need to enter on Line 14 of Form 6251. So if your client comes in with one of these babies, it means you're pulling out Form 6251 to enter some income on there. And the entry of income on 6251 can trigger alternative minimum tax. And because the client may need to pay alternative minimum tax from this income, we refer to this as phantom income. It's money they haven't actually received, but they're going to have to include it in alternative minimum tax and pay tax on it anyway. Now, this phantom income that's taxable under the AMT, it is not taxable under the regular tax. So if you as an employee are granted an option to buy stock at some future date, you are granted the stock and then you are given a date where you're allowed to exercise it and you eventually get to this date where you exercise it. And the difference between the grant price and the fair market value on the exercise date, that spread, it can be income to you, but if you meet the holding periods, it's not treated as income when you exercise it for the regular tax, but it is treated as income under alternative minimum tax. So let's talk about the required holding period because the holding period itself determines whether or not there could be phantom income. To receive special tax treatment under the regular tax, that is not have to report anything in your income when you exercise the option, you must hold your statutory stock options for the following periods of time, at least one year from the exercise date and at least two years from the grant date. So the grant date is the date the employer says, we're going to give you the ability to buy this stock at XYZ price. And the exercise date is the date when you actually acquire the stock. If you do not meet the holding period requirements for ISOs, you may have ordinary income, reportable as wages, for the year that you sell or dispose of the stock. And if you do not meet the holding period requirements and then you sell your stock at a gain, the difference between the option price and the fair market value is includable in your income as wages. And the transaction would usually be reported in the same manner as non-statutory or non-qualified stock options and qualified ESPPs that we're going to discuss later. So to help me make sense of this, we're going to discuss first a qualifying ISO sale. In this example, we have a character named Darby, and her employer granted her an incentive stock option on July 13, 2012, to buy 100 shares of Frisian Technology, Inc. at $20 a share. She exercised or purchased the stock on January 10, 2013, for $20 a share, when the fair market value of Frisian stock was $30 a share. Then on August 23, 2014, she sold the stock for $35 a share. In January of 2015, she received Form 3921 and properly reported the $10 per share discount on the option exercise by entering $1,000 as an increase to her 2013 alternative minimum taxable income on Form 6251. So let's look at these numbers again. She buys 100 shares of Frisian stock at $20 a share. She exercises the stock on January of 2013 for $20 a share when the fair market value is $30 a share. So the difference or the spread between what she pays for it and what it's worth ends up being $1,000, $10 times 100 shares. 
That $1,000 is taxable for purposes of alternative minimum tax, so she goes over to her 6251 and she enters that $1,000 there. She now has dual basis. She has a different basis under AMT than she does under the regular tax. But for purposes of the regular tax, she's realized no income at all. She simply holds stock that has value now when she decides to sell it of $35 a share. So when we look at the 3921 that's issued to her in 2013, we see that it's got an exercise price of $20 per share and a fair market value of $30 per share. The spread or difference between these two numbers multiplied by the amount of box 5 is going to be the amount that she needs to include on Form 6251. So let's now see what happens when she sells the stock. And again, we have figuring basis under the regular tax, and we've been talking about basis up here under the alternative minimum tax as well. So to figure basis and gain under the regular tax, in the case of a qualified ISA, we begin with the number of shares, the grant price, and the uh, fair market value on the exercise date. If she meets the holding periods, which are two years after the grant date and more than one year after the exercise date, then she has a qualifying disposition of her stock, and she will realize no ordinary income. That means she'll recognize no wage income on her tax return in the year she sells. The only income she's going to have to recognize is capital gain income. And the capital gain income is going to be the difference between the grant price and the sales price. Now, because Darby held the stock for more than one year and sold the stock at least two years after receiving the stock option grant, she must report her gain or loss as capital gain or loss, and she report her gain as a capital gain calculated as follows. We take the selling price of $35 times 100 shares for $3,500, and then we subtract out the purchase price, which is $20 times 100 shares for $2,000. The gain is $1,500. None of it is reported as wages, and all of it is reported as a capital gain. But for purposes of the alternative minimum tax, things are a little different. The difference between the grant price and the fair market value on the date of sale is income under the alternative minimum tax. And because Darby reported $1,000 as income under the AMT on her 2013 return, her basis under AMT rules is $3,000 instead of $2,000, which was the fair market value on the exercise date. And therefore, her gain under the AMT is only $500 rather than $1,500 as it is under the regular tax. So let's take another look at a different option, which is a disqualifying ISO sale. Let's just suppose that Darby's employer granted her an incentive stock option on July 13, 2012 to buy 100 shares of Frisian Technology, Inc. at $20 a share. She exercised or purchased the stock on January 10, 2013 for $20 a share when the fair market value was 30 But then on April 23, 2014, she sold the stock for $35 per share. Now, even though she held the stock for more than a year, which would make it held long term, she didn't hold it more than two years from the grant date. And because she didn't hold it for more than two years from the grant date, she has a disqualified transaction there. So what's going to happen? Well, no longer is she going to be allowed to get capital gain treatment on the entire profit. In the earlier example under the regular tax, she was allowed capital gain treatment on the entire amount of capital gain. But this time around, we're going to have to look at some different numbers instead. And instead of using a cost basis of $20 per share under the regular tax, she's going to ultimately use a cost basis of $30 per share for capital gain purposes. And the difference between the 20 and the 30 will become ordinary income to her that's taxable on her W-2. So even though Darby held the stock for more than one year and she sold the stock within two years of the option date, and she must report the difference between the option price and the fair market value as wages, the rest of any gain that she has will be capital gain. So the selling price in both illustrations is the same. 35 times 100 shares is $3,500. And the purchase price is the same in both illustrations, $2,000. So her gain in both situations is $1,500, but how it's taxed is importantly different. Under the second illustration, because she did not meet the holding period requirements, her employer is going to have to gross up her wages by $1,000 and tax her on the spread, the difference between the grant and the fair market value on exercise. So $1,000 gets included in her income, and that $1,000 would then add to her basis. So when she sells the stock, she's going to sell the stock for a gain of only $500 instead of a gain of $1,500. So she'll receive capital gain treatment on $500 of income and ordinary wage income treatment of $1,000 on the balance. Now, in this situation, Darby's employer should report the $1,000 in box 12 with a code V, 
you can see right here, to indicate that her wages were grossed up by $1,000 as a result of this disqualifying disposition. So that's a perfect world where that happens. All right, so now we're on to employee stock option and stock purchase plans. We're going to spend more time on this topic. Hopefully, at the end of it, you'll start to understand it reasonably well. Because they're so popular, it's important to get it. Employees who exercise stock option rights or participate in ESPPs are usually very confused and don't know how to report their income from the sale of stock or how to calculate their cost basis in the options they exercise. I do see your question there, Gordon. What if she no longer works for that employer? Well, if she no longer works for that employer, then she's going to have to recognize that spread as ordinary income on her own and enter it on the tax return that way, and it should go on line 7 as wage income. So she should be recognizing that herself. So how you calculate ESPPs depends on the kind of employee you are and the type of plan your company has. There are two kinds of ESPP plans. There's qualified Section 423 ESPP plans and there's non-qualified ESPP plans. We're going to pretty much spend all of our time talking about the qualified plans because the non-qualified plans, there's really nothing much you need to know. The difference between just buying stock on the open market and tracking your basis in the stock that way would be no different than if you participated in a non-qualified ESPP plan. So the confusions really start when you're dealing with qualified ESPP plans, and those are the plans that companies tend to offer. Now, I've told you that I, normally when I'm dealing with these ESPPs, I'm looking at Intel stock. It just happens to be that that's the company that's close to me that's issuing them all the time. But I've also prepared tax returns for clients who work for Walmart as stockers and cashiers and so forth because Walmart does have an employee stock purchase plan as well. So you shouldn't assume that these ESPPs only follow you know, white-collar jobs and high-tech firms. Although they're more common in those locations, they can happen everywhere, and Walmart is proof of that. So most employee stock purchase plans are qualified plans. The Qualified Section 423 ESPP is a plan which confers special tax advantages. Qualified ESPPs are structured to meet the requirements of Internal Revenue Code Section 423, which may include or does include that the purchase price discount can be any amount up to 15%, i.e., that means that the purchase price can be as low as 85% of the stock's fair market value. So if the employer's stock is trading at $100 per share, under an employee stock purchase plan, the employee can actually buy that stock for $85 a share. That's the difference or the spread between what the stock is worth and what the employee pays for it. And that spread ultimately becomes wage income to the employee, but it's also a bonus to the employee at the same time because the fact that they can then buy that stock at a discount and then sell it allows them to walk away with that 15% profit. Some employees buy and hold their stock, but most just buy and sell it in the same day. They'll, they'll go through a particular time where they're waiting to be able to sell their ESPP shares. They come and they buy them and they sell them often in the same day or within a three-day period. Now, many plans also have a look-back provision that allows the plan to use the closing company's share price of either the offering date or the purchase date, whichever is lower. And I'll show you an illustration in a few minutes of what that might look like. You cannot purchase more than $25,000 of shares under the plan valued at the undiscounted stock price on the first day of the offering period in any one calendar year. Unused amounts can be carried forward if the offering period spans more than one year, and 5% or more shareholders cannot participate in the plan. And finally, discounts that are allowed under the plan are not subject to Social Security and Medicare taxes. But what about non-qualified ESPPs? Well, as I said, if you're dealing with a non-qualified ESPP, there's really nothing special in terms of tax law that you need to know about it to differentiate it from just buying stock outright. But uh, just so you kind of get it, I've got a little bit of information in here for you. Non-qualified plans are not structured to meet the requirements of Internal Revenue Code Section 423 and may have the following characteristics. Stock can be purchased through payroll deductions, but any discount allowed will be subjected to Social Security and Medicare tax and income tax withholdings at the time of purchase. Ordinary income will be calculated on the purchase date as the difference between the value of the shares on the purchase date and the purchase price. This amount will be treated as wages subject to tax withholding and should be included on your W-2 as determined by your employer. The stock does not have a holding period, and when you sell the shares, any gain or loss will be taxed as a capital gain or loss. You can learn more about ESPPs in IRS Publication 525. 
so we're going to spend the rest of this segment talking about qualified Section 423 ESPPs. If you participated in an employee stock purchase plan, you do not include any amount in your gross income when you receive a grant or exercise an option to purchase stock. When you sell the stock that you purchased by exercising an option, you may have to report wage compensation and capital gain or loss. Your holding period for ESPP stock begins on the day after you exercise the option. If the holding period requirements are described below are met, the sale of stock is generally treated as capital gain or loss. However, you may also have wage compensation if the option price of the stock was below the stock's fair market value at the time the option was granted, or you did not meet both of the holding period requirements. Well, really, the whole point behind qualified employee stock purchase plans is that you are buying the stock at a discount. That's the whole reason for doing them. So you can pretty much work off the assumption that there probably was a discount, so when the stock is sold, there's going to be some gross up going on in the employee's W-2. And bear in mind that if they've sold the ESPPs and there was a gross up on the W-2, then the document that you're looking at, that 1099B with the basis amount in box three, you automatically know it's wrong because the IRS instructions say that it has to be the wrong number. Crazy. So holding period for ESPPs. To meet the holding period requirement for qualifying ESPPs, you must hold the stock for more than two years from the time the option was granted to you and more than one year from the date that the stock was transferred to you. If you do not meet both these holding period requirements, then there is a disqualifying disposition of the stock. So now we have to pay attention to how we handle the difference between disqualifying disposition and qualifying disposition. And interestingly, the look of the calculations is very similar to what happens with incentive stock options when they are issued and become disqualified because you sell too soon. So if the holding period requirements are not met, then your employer should refer or report compensation or wage income in box one of your Form W-2 in the year of the disqualifying disposition. The amount to be reported as compensation income is the excess of the fair market value of the stock on the date the stock was transferred to you over the amount you paid for the shares. So I'm going to do another note here because I know this part confuses people. I say it over and over again and it's still kind of just doesn't come together for a lot of people, so I'm going to talk about it. So there's the grant price, and then there's the fair market value of $100 per share. The difference between those two numbers is easy to get, even for me, who's not so good with numbers. <laughs> it's $15 per share difference. And the wording, the description for difference, difference equals spread. So if we talk about the spread on ESPP shares, this is what we're talking about, the difference between the fair market value of the stock on the date of either the grant or the date of sale. And there's actually some important differences there. So we have a grant price of $85 a share and a fair market value of $100 per share. Depending on the particular situation, an employee could purchase the shares based on a fair market value on the grant date. So we could have a fair market value on the grant date and we could have a different fair market value on the purchase date. Let's just suppose we've got a fair market value of 120 per share on the purchase date. So either way, you're talking about a difference. In the first example, we have a difference of $15 per share, so the spread is $15. And in the second example, we have a difference of $35 a share. But either way, difference equals spread. difference equals spread. All right. So when we're worrying about fully stock purchase plan shares, if we have a qualifying disposition where the stock is held for at least two years after the grant date and at least one year after the purchase date, then you have a qualifying disposition. If you have a qualifying disposition that meets that two and one year rule, then the spread that you're going to use is the smaller of the two numbers, $15. And if you have a disqualifying disposition, then you're going to use the spread that is the larger of the two numbers. There can be exceptions to that, but this is generally the case. So as I'm going into some more illustrations with lots of numbers and a lot of complexity, I want you to always be coming back to this basic presumption that the difference between the grant price and the fair market value is referred to as the spread. And whatever the spread is, it's wage income to the employee. And the reason that it's wage income is because that discount is given for services rendered. 
Well, we all know that when an employee receives property in exchange for services, that that property becomes wage income to the employee. So if you've got an employee and you say, hey, good work, I'm going to give you a new car because <laughs> you've done great work for us, well, that employee is going to get a W-2 with a, holy cow, I have to pay tax on a $30,000 car? <laughs> Maybe I should have taken the cash bonus instead. So employers are not likely to give a car, but they do like to give stock. And the deal with stock is figuring out what amount is going to be includable as compensation to the employee. And the amount that's includable as compensation to the employee is the spread. So the question is, what is the spread that's going to be used? Is it going to be the lower number or the higher number? And the answer is, well, it depends on if they met that one and two year rule or if they didn't meet the one or two year rule. Let's go back up to this heading here, which says, if the holding period requirements are not met then your employer should report as wage income in box one of your Form W-2 for the year of the qualifying disposition, the excess of the fair market value of the stock on the date the stock was transferred to you over the amount that you paid for the shares. And if the holding periods are met and the option exercise price is below the fair market value of the stock at the time the option was granted, then you report the discount as compensation in your wage income when you sell the stock. And generally, this compensation is the lesser of the excess of the fair market value of the stock on the date of disposition over the exercise price or the excess of the fair market value of the stock at the time the option was granted over the exercise price. Holy cow, <laughs> what does that mean? Well, the reason it's being worded that way is because let's just suppose on the grant date, the fair market value is $100 per share. And then down the road, you decide to purchase the stock, and you get it for $85 when on the grant date it was 100 That's the lesser number if you meet the qualified holding periods. But let's just suppose you're given a grant to purchase the shares at $85 a share when the fair market value is $120 per share. And then later on, by the time it's time to purchase the shares, your 15% discount ultimately is going to be off a different number. So the spread is the difference between the fair market value on the grant date. And if the fair market value drops, then things can change. So let's just suppose you are given a grant to purchase your shares for $102 when the fair market value is $120. But by the time it's time to make the purchase, the price has dropped to eighty-five or to hundred dollars per share. You would then go for the lower number of eighty-five dollars a share. So that's the look-back period that we're talking about. So you purchase the stock based on the lesser of the fifteen percent discount on the fair market value on the grant date, or the lesser of the fifteen percent discount on the purchase date. And if the stock is trading well, it could go up in value, but sometimes it's slumped and gone the other direction. In that case, you would choose, obviously, to go with $85 a share rather than $102 a share as your starting point. Okay, so back to these illustrations. I'm sure I've confused you, and I'll probably confuse you some more, and you'll probably spend some time reading this and trying to absorb it and going through my illustrations on your own to really finally get it all. But if the holding period requirements are met and your gain is more than the amount you report as compensation income, then the remainder is a capital gain that it was reported on Form 1040, Schedule D, and on Form 8949. If you sell the stock for less than the amount you paid, you have a capital loss and you do not recognize ordinary income. So Form 3922 is issued because often there are errors on reporting basis in these stocks. And so we're going to spend a couple minutes talking about 3922. It was introduced in 2010, and the reason it was introduced is because employees very often couldn't figure out what their basis in stock was because they didn't know what the grant price was versus the fair market value on the grant date versus the fair market value on the purchase date. It was just too much information for them to absorb, and so IRS released this form to provide all of that information. You can see it says, what was the date that the option was granted and what was the date that the option was exercised? And then what was the fair market value per share on the grant date and what was the fair market value per share on the exercise date? So you're going to determine what your client's basis is 
on the lesser of these two numbers typically. If the fair market value per share on the grant date is a lower number than on the exercise date, then you would go with box three. And if the fair market value on the exercise date is less than the fair market value on the grant date, then you would use this number for establishing basis. <laughs> and then it shows how much they actually paid for the shares, which would be a discount usually. They would pay less in box five than is the fair market value. And the difference between these two numbers is going to be the wage income and the amount that they're going to be grossed up by on their W-2. So let's suppose that the fair market value per share on the exercise date is $100, and the fair market value per share on the grant date is $90. Then we can say, okay, well, clearly the employee, using the look-back method, would pick the lower of those two numbers because he's going to get a discount off the lower of those two numbers, and that would be the exercise price. So the, he would be able to buy it. 85% of 90. So we'll go 90 times 0.85. And when we do that, we get 76.5. That would be the exercise price. So the interesting thing is that what will happen is this exercise price, for purposes of the 1099B, that's considered to be the purchase price. And that's the amount that's going to get entered on the 1099B. But the true cost to the employee is actually $90. And how it's going to be broken down is that the additional amount, if the employee pays $76.50 for the stock, the difference between $76.50 and $90 is going to get included in that employee's W-2. And once it's been included in their W-2 and they pay tax on it, then it means the basis is the same as the fair market value on the grant date. But ultimately, if the stock drops in value, and so these numbers are reversed, we would still go with any intelligent employee, <laughs> the employee would be, you know, using the look back method, go for the lower of the two numbers, whichever side uh, it's arranged on. All right, next page. Calculating the basis in ESPP shares. So I'm hoping that I, that little illustration I did there for you real quick will help you understand that. For an ESPP option granted at a discount, your basis is the amount you paid plus any amount you must include in your income as wages. The amount that must be added to wages is the lesser of the discount-based on the beginning of the offering period or the profit when you sold the shares. And here we have an example where we have a qualifying ESPP sale. Your employer granted you an option under its ESPP plan on April 19, 2012 to buy 100 shares of mega corporation stock at $20 per share. Mega corporation stock was worth $22 a share when the option was granted. You exercised or purchased the stock for $20 a share when the fair market value of mega corporation stock was $23 a share. And then on December 23, 2014, you sold the stock for $30 a share. Now, you're probably already noticing that the spread here is not equivalent to 15%, and it's because it doesn't have to be. The greatest it can be is 15%, but it can be less than that. And in this situation, it is less than that. Because you held the stock for more than one year and you sold the stock at least two years after receiving the ESP stock option grant, you have a qualifying sale. You must report the difference between the option price of $20 and the fair market value at the grant date, $22, as wages. And the rest of your gain is a capital gain calculated as follows. So we take the selling price, 30 times 100 shares, or $3,000. We subtract out the purchase price, 20 times 100 shares, and we have $2,000. The gain is $1,000. The amount reported as wages is $200, which is the spread, and that increases the cost basis to $2,200. If we sell for $3,000 with a cost basis of $22, it means we have a capital gain of $800. And, of course, $800 will be the reported gain on Form 8949, and we know for a fact that the amount of cost that will be reported to IRS on 1099B is only $2,000. So we're going to have to make a manual adjustment on the 8949 to bump the basis up by $200 so that the employee pays tax on the $800 and doesn't actually pay tax on the $1,000 and duplicate and pay tax twice on that $200 spread. So I've taken those numbers and put them into a table here because we have a qualifying disposition. We start with the fair market value on the grant date. We take the exercise price and we take the sales price, and the spread is the difference between these two numbers because it's a qualifying disposition. And you can see right here it says the fair market value on the exercise date. That number isn't relevant to this exercise or this illustration because it's qualifying. But now we're going to look at the next example, which is a disqualifying sale. Your employer granted you an option under its ESPP plan on April 19, 2012 to buy 100 shares of Mega Corporation stock at $20 a share. Mega Corporation stock was worth $22 per share when the option was granted. 
You exercised or purchased the stock on April 10, 2013 for $20 a share when the fair market value of mega corporation stock is $23 a share. And then on April 23, 2014, you sold the stock for $30 a share. Well, we've got a problem. We haven't held it more than a year. We haven't held it long term. And we haven't met that two-year period either. So we've got the grant date. We've got the exercise date. The exercise date is 2013, 10-10, but we sold it on April 23, 2014. That's not more than a year. It is more than two years after the grant date, but it's not more than two, one year after the exercise date, and therein lies the problem. So this time around, we still have the same grant price of $20, or the exercise price of $20, but we don't get to use the spread between the fair market value on the grant date and the exercise price. Instead, we're forced to use the higher number, which is the fair market value on the exercise date. And so now the spread is $3 instead of just $2. So how does that affect our equation? Well, we still sell the stock for $30 a share for $3,000, and the purchase price is still $20 a share or $2,000, and the profit is still $1,000. But how the employer reports it on your W-2 now differs. We're going to have to use the higher spread amount of $300 as wage income. And once you add uh, $300 to $2,000, it gives you a cost basis of $2,300 and a net capital gain, in this case, short-term capital gain of $700. So we're going to take a break at this time for 10 minutes, and I'm going to put up the first password of the class. Be sure to jot it down. Password number one is Scotia, S-C-O-T-I-A, Scotia. All right, so back from our break, and we're going to move on to the next topic that you see here in the manual. And one of the things I like to do when I'm – deciphering all of this information about what's compensation and what's not and why the employer has to do what it does. Is there a place that that's all written down for you? And the answer is you're not really going to see much in IRS instructions or in the publications that really illustrate what I've just shown you. You might find this information if you do Google searches on the Internet and look for explanations there. But the one place that IRS does have something to say about these ESTPs and also the NQOs is in the employer's handbook. And that makes sense because if we're talking about a payroll issue with the, these spread amounts, it seems reasonable that it ought to be included in the publication on payroll. And that is exactly where you find it. So if you go to publication 15B, Employer's Tax Guide to Fringe Benefits, and flip to page 11, you will see that the IRS instructs employers to include as income in box one of Form W-2 the discount given to an employee on stock acquired by the employee through an employee stock purchase plan when the stock is sold or disposed of and the spread or difference between the exercise price and the fair market value of the stock at the time of the exercise given in a disqualifying sale or disposition of stock acquired by an employee through the exercise of an incentive stock option plan or an employee stock purchase plan option. So that's the nutshell. Those few words there mean all of this complexity. So let's move down to some more examples of what we're talking about. And I feel if I give you enough examples, it'll start to make sense to you. In this example, we have a qualified ESPP and the price is going up. So here we're going to talk a little bit more about the look back periods and how the employee stock purchase plan really works. So to begin with, an employee stock purchase plan allows an employee to take a certain amount of money from each paycheck and put it into a pot or a savings account. And it continues to accumulate there throughout the period of time that is called the offering period until the offering period ends. And on the date of the offering period, however much money has accumulated in that plan is then used to buy stock. And stock is purchased at a predetermined discount, and the employee is going to use the lesser of the discount off the fair market value on the exercise date or the fair market value on the grant date. So it's looking at those two dates, seeing when the stock is worth the least, and then giving that 15% discount. So the discount doesn't have to be 15%. It can be less than 15, but it can't be more than 15. And in my illustrations here, we're using 15. So Lara participates in an ESPP plan with her employer, Argo Inc. when the shares are worth $40. She allocates $20 per week from her salary for 52 pay periods and at the end of the offering period she has accumulated $1,040 and she decides to buy shares when the current price is $45 a share. 
Lara can choose to buy the shares at $34 per share, which is 15% off the $40 price at the beginning of the offering period. Thus, she will pay $34 for shares that are now worth $45 per share. That's a good deal. Her $1,040 will allow her to purchase 30.588 shares at $34 a share. Lara decides to hold the shares for two years after the grant date and one year after the exercise date and then sells the shares for $50 per share through UBS Financial Services, which charges her a $10 transaction fee on the sale. The 1099B she receives from UBS shows the gross proceeds from the sale are $1,519, and we get that by taking 30.588 shares and multiplying that by $50 a share and then subtracting out that $10 transaction fee. Because this is a qualifying disposition, Argo Inc. will include the difference between the discounted price of $34 and the fair market value on the grant date, $40, to figure her wage income. Her income from the sale will be figured as follows. Argo Inc. should include $183.52 as wage income on her W-2. And how do they get that? Well, they take the 30.588 shares she purchased and multiply that by the discount per share that she was able to receive. So 30.588 times $6 a share is $182.50, and that's going to be bumped up and added into the box one wages on our W-2. So what's her basis in the shares? Well, her basis is going to be the amount she paid for the shares, which is $1,040, right? The amount she accumulated in her pool when she made the purchase, plus the $183.52 that her employer added to her pay for the year. So her basis is $1,223.52, which is $1,040 plus $183.52. Laura will report a long-term capital gain of $295.87. And how do you get that? Well, you're going to take the sales price of $1,590, or the amount realized from the sale, of $1,519.40, and you can subtract from that her basis in the shares. And when you are done, you get $295.87. In example number two, the share price is going to go down during the offering period. Assume the same facts as in example one, except that during the uh, offering period, the price of Argo shares has dropped to $38 at the end of the offering period. Well, it wouldn't make much sense for her to ask for a 15% discount on $40 when she can go with a 15% discount on $38. And so she's going to go with that other option. Well, 15% off 38 means that she's only going to have to pay $32.3 per share, and that means that her discount is going to be $5.70 per share. So it's 15% off of 38, that's 570, and then if you take 570 off 38, you've got 32.30 per share. So that's her cost per share. And so because the cost per share is less in this situation, her $1,040 is going to buy her 32.198 shares. And her compensation that will be reported on her W-2 is going to be $183.50, which is 32.198 times $5.70. Let's look at another example with the same character, but this time we're going to have a disqualifying ESPP because Lara is going to engage in a same-day sale. And quite frankly, this is what most employees do, but some employees, especially when they get to be higher income, <laughs> at least this is just my observation, if I'm dealing with an employee that is, you know, really living off of their ESPP profits, they're going to wait for the offering period to end, they're going to exercise, and they're going to sell on the same day, and they're going to do it like clockwork every year. Those ones are easy. The more complicated ones are when an employee exercises the ESPPs and maybe sells some and then sits on others and then monitors to see which point in time they're going to sell those others and chooses to sell others that have the highest cost basis. And now you've got kind of a muddled mess of which ones they're selling and which ones they're keeping, all of which have to be tracked with reporting statements. But in example number three, we do have a situation where Lara is doing precisely what is most normal, which is to sell the stock almost immediately that it's acquired, a same-day sale. Assume the same facts as in example one, except that Lara decides to sell her shares the same day that she purchases them for $45 a share. The sale of the shares is completed through UBS Financial Services, and she incurs a $10 transaction fee, and the net proceeds from the sale are $1,366.46. That's $45 times 30.588 minus $10. Because this is a disqualifying disposition, Argo Inc. will include the difference between the discount price of $34 and the fair market value on the exercise date of $45, 
to figure her wage income. Thus, her income from the sale is going to be figured as follows. Argo Inc. should include $336.46 as taxable wages on box one of her W-2. How do we get that number? We're going to take 30.588 shares and multiply that by a spread, which is now $11. In the earlier example, she had a spread of $6 because she met those holding period requirements. In this example, she has not met the holding period requirements, so she's going to go for the larger spread that has to be included in her wages as income. And in this case, that is $336.46. So because she has a, a larger spread being included in her wages, she now has a larger basis in the shares. Her basis in the shares is going to be $1,040 she pays for them plus the $336.46 that is included as wage income to her. So her total cost basis is $1,376.46. She will then end up reporting a capital loss because remember up here, we showed you that the sales proceeds from the shares is $1,366.46. So the selling price is 1366.46, but the cost basis is 1376.46. That means she actually has a loss of $10. And that's the whole point. Anytime you're looking at a disqualifying disposition of ESPP shares, you're nearly always going to be looking at a loss. It's possible to have a profit, but more often you're going to be seeing loss, and it's usually a small loss, 10 9 $2, $24. Some number like that is what I typically see. So let's talk now about non-qualified stock options and disqualified ESPPs. Because many employees sell their stock as soon as they are purchased, the most common types of transactions seen are sales of non-qualified options, which are NQOs, and disqualifying sales of ESPP shares. The calculation of basis is the same for both of these types of transactions. However, they are reflected differently on the W-2. As an employee of a company, your net income from the sale of shares acquired from NQOs and ESPPs is generally treated as wage income as follows. If your NQO plan allows you to purchase stock at less than its fair market value, the difference between the fair market value of the stock on the day you purchase it from your employer and what you actually pay for it must be included in your income as wages. And the amount included as wages is put in box one as well as box three and five of your W-2, and it's identified in box 12 of the code V. So the bottom line is that with NQOs, the spread that's taxable as wage income is subject to Social Security, Medicare, and income tax withholdings. And if you sell an ESPP, but when you're dealing with ESPP shares, whether they're qualified or disqualified dispositions, whatever spread you're looking at there is subject only to income tax and is not subject to Social Security and Medicare tax. And knowing that information can help you actually figure a few things up if you have access to your client's pay stub. And I do like to look at pay stubs, which they almost never have. But if they have one, I get really excited because I like to see all my numbers come together. Because I'm not much of a numbers person, I'm always lacking confidence. And when I can sit down and study stuff and find where everything comes together, I'm satisfied that I've got it correct. That's what I mean. So I'm going to give you an illustration here because I've just finished telling you that the most common types of transactions that I personally see with my clients are disqualifying dispositions of ESPPs and the sale of NQOs. So I'm going to give you an illustration here, and this illustration is actually from a real client of mine. I just His stuff was so intricate with so many different transactions going on that I spent quite a bit of time figuring out how to do this about a decade ago. And ever since then, I've used this poor client stuff as an illustration for my tax school students. And so this is part of the reason why I don't have round numbers, because the numbers that are on here are actually the numbers he had all of those years ago. So let's take a look at it. There's two parts. We have an ESPP exercise and sale, and a little bit farther down, we have an NQO exercise and sale, and this is all with the same client. This client is named Tech Employee who purchased and sold ESPP shares as follows. On uh, February 19, he bought and sold 199 ESPP shares for $21 per share, or $4,231 total. At the time, the fair market value of those shares was actually $30 per share, or $6,064. Then on August 19, he bought and sold 82 shares at $18 per share, or $1,533. The fair market value of the shares on August 19 was actually $22 a share, or $1,804. So how are we going to figure his basis in the shares? Well, we're going to look at the number of shares he bought and the amount that he paid for the shares. That's the exercise price. And the amount he paid for the shares, 4231 plus 1533. 
Now, we know for a fact that this amount is the amount that is going to get reported to the IRS on the 1099-B. And we take those two numbers to, and add them together. We've got essentially a basis amount for those two transactions. But on the date that he exercised those shares, the fair market value was 6065 for the 199 shares, and it was 1804 for the 82 shares. And so the difference were spread between the exercise price and the fair market value is shown on the line below, 1833 and 270. And those numbers total $2,103.79. And that's the number that I know needs to be somewhere on his pay stub as a gross up. I'm looking for evidence that that was somehow grossed up somewhere. I might also be able to figure that number out by looking at his 3922 document. But I did this illustration or ran across this particular client long before 3922s were out there. So 3922 can help you arrive at the same situation, but I still like to go to the pay stub and go through all of the rules and make sure things are coming out the way that I want them to. So ultimately, what's going to happen is this $2,100 $103.79 is now wage income to tech employee, and I'm going to be looking for that wage income to show up on the pay stub. When it hits the W-2, there is going to be a signal that it is on the W-2, but it's not because there's going to be a code V. It's simply going to come out through the math of doing computations for what's in box one versus what's in other boxes of the W-2. The other thing that's important about this spread is that based on the instructions that are now in play for completing Form 8949, I know that this spread is going to be the adjustment amount I need to enter on my client's 8949. This is the number I need for 8949. Now let's look at the NQO because it's the same employee but a different type of employee benefit. The first one we talked about was ESPPs, and now we're on to NQOs. On March 3, Tech exercised an option to buy and sell 999 ISO shares as follows. He exercised 359 shares at $20 per share and 640 shares at $19 per share. The total cost of those 999 shares is $19,422. The fair market value on March 3 was actually $30 per share or $29,970. On June 7, Tech exercised an option to buy and sell 1,275 ISO shares as follows, 262 shares at $18 a share and 1,013 shares at $20 a share. The total cost of those 1,275 shares is $25,893, but the fair market value on June 7 was actually $28.50 per share or $36 thousand three hundred and thirty seven dollars since both these option sales are non-qualifying dispositions you calculate tax basis in the iso shares as follows you begin by looking at the number of shares and the amount that he pays for the shares nineteen thousand four twenty two and twenty five eight ninety three these are the amounts that are going to carry to the ten ninety nine b and be reflected in box three as cost basis and then the difference between the exercise price and the fair market value is the amount that's going to be included in his wages. And so if you take 10547 and add 10444 when you do that, you get $20,991 and change. And that is the amount that we're going to be looking to see included on his W-2 with a code V. And so we're moving over to the W-2 here, and you can see that I've taken those same two numbers, and I'm indicating these are the numbers that should be reflected on the W-2 with a code V. So the NQO wage adjustment totals $20,991.92, and that rounds up to $20,992. So you can see we have a code V here appearing on the W-2. But what about the ESPP? How can we tell if it's on here? If there's no code for an ESPP, how would we know it's here? Well, the interesting thing is it is here. You just have to look for it a little bit harder. The information is here. So we start with the knowledge that a 401k deferral is going to be a reduction to Social Security income as well as wage income. But we also know that the $2,103 of ESPP gain or spread is not subject to those Social Security tax. So let's take $76,121 and subtract out $7,797. When we do that, we get $68,324. Well, then what we do is we add in that spread, that wage income from the ESPP sale, and when we do that, we get 70428 which is the amount shown in box one of the W-2. So 
I can absolutely promise you this is what my client's W-2 looked like and how I was able to figure out what was going on. Now, on the NQO, this one is a lot easier because we know just looking at the spread that the spread should match the code V, and it does. So really, NQOs are easier to calculate the difference for because ultimately they're telling you the difference right on the W-2. So let's move on to the next page where we're going to take this information and keep on going with it. So now, because tech employee has obviously sold these shares in a disqualifying disposition, there must be a 1099B floating around out there somewhere, and there is, and so I've got it here for you. And remember that you'll almost never see a 1099B that looks like the IRS's standardized format. I showed that to you at the beginning of today's class, but you'll never get a 1099B that looks like that. You're instead going to get these substitute 1099B statements, and they summarize all of the information and identify the information with a box number. So you can see here it's saying the quantity sold is 199 shares. The description for box 1A is tech company, and that description is going to carry to the 8949. And then we have the date acquired, and that's for each of these transactions. We have the date disposed of for each of these transactions, and those will need to correspond to the amounts entered on form 8949. We then have the sales proceeds less commissions, and when we add up all of those sales amounts, we get $73,950. And then we have the cost basis amounts. And these cost basis amounts, remember, do not include any of the wage amount that was added to W-2. So we automatically know by looking at this particular 1099-B that the basis is wrong. The interesting thing, though, is that IRS says whatever amount is on the 1099-B, that's the amount that we're going to transfer over to the Schedule D. And we're looking at a Schedule D here where I've completed Part 1, Short-Term Capital Gains and Losses. And we're going to fill out Line 1B because this is for transactions that were reported on Form 8949 with Box A checked. And you can see right here it says Box A is checked. And here it says it again, basis was reported to the IRS. So we're going to go over to column D on line 1, and we're going to enter the 73,953. That needs to carry down and be entered here, 73,953. And there should be a corresponding basis amount that is also a match. And now we've got a problem because the basis amount is wrong. How do we account for that? Well, that's what the adjustment column is for. So in the adjustment column, we're going to put the difference. And where does that 23,095 come from? Well, it's the sum total of these two numbers. So if I go back up, I take this $2,103 spread on the ESPPs, and I take the $20,991 spread on the NQOs. When I add those two numbers together, I get $23,095 or rounded up to $96. And that's the amount that I'm going to enter here. And it looks like I rounded down 23095 So the gain or loss is actually a loss. And this is what you should be looking for when you're dealing with these NQOs and ESPP shares is that you're ultimately reporting a loss because if you're seeing a profit, something's wrong. You should not be seeing a profit unless they actually held the stock long enough for a profit to occur. I mean, if they purchased the stock and then, I don't know, sit on it for a month before selling it, it would still be a disqualifying disposition, but it could go up in value. But these same-day sales, they should always be showing a loss. And the reason they show a loss is because the brokerage house charges these fees, and this loss is essentially equivalent to those fees. So again, and I've got that down in pink here, the 223 loss that you are seeing reported in column H right here is normal because of brokerage costs. And you should expect to see the sale of non-qualifying ESPPs and stock options resulting in a small loss. If the Form 1099-B indicates ESPPs and NQOs were sold at a gain, you should always work from the presumption that the 1099-B is showing incorrect basis, and now the homework begins to trying to figure out what the correct basis is. For NQOs, figuring the correct basis should be relatively simple. You can start by looking for a code V, but if there's been multiple sales, the code V doesn't tell you how much was for each sale, does it? So you're still going to have to go back to other resources, and hopefully the employee has those. 
I often send my clients out to do lots of homework to pull those together. Now, here's the 8949. On the earlier page, I actually showed you the Schedule D first. But, of course, you can't do a Schedule D before you've done the 8949, and that's what I'm showing you now here. So on the 8949, I have checked box A for short-term transactions reported on 1099B, where basis was reported, and I then describe each transaction. I have the date acquired, the date sold. These all match the 1099B document. And then I have the proceeds that match the amounts on the 1099B. I have the cost or other basis that's reported on the 1099B. And then I go through and I enter the adjustment amount on a per transaction basis. And finally, for each transaction, we have the net loss. And you can see on one of these transactions, we're actually a break even when we're done. So cashless transactions, that's the next thing to talk about. Most of the time, all of this is going on in the background. The employee doesn't even know that it's going on. They simply know that they've been putting money into this pool, and now it's time to sell. And when they sell, they're going to get a bonus. That's all they care about. The intricacies of what's going on in the background, why they got that bonus and how that bonus was calculated, is far less important to them than the fact that they've got their bonus. And the reason they don't really know what's going on is it's all done in cashless transactions. It's not like they're writing a check to buy the stock, and then they're selling the stock and getting another check back. It often doesn't happen that way. Often what happens is they just make an order to sell. The order to sell occurs. There's a gross up on their W-2, and they get a gross up on their payroll, and they might get an additional, like, say, bonus paycheck for that period. So they never actually see anything that would apparently be a sale of stock. The only thing they see is, like, a bonus paycheck. And most employees do exercise and sell their options in cashless transactions. In a cashless transaction, the stock is exercised and sold without the employee ever paying for the stock directly. The net income from the sale of the stock is added to the employee's wages and is reported on his or her W-2. Social Security, Medicare, and withholding tax are deducted from the proceeds. Employees who sell their stock options in a cashless transaction do not have to report the sale of options on Schedule D and Form 8949 when their employers properly report that income on the W-2. However, if an employee receives a 1099-B for the sale of options, then the Schedule D and the 8949 must be filed. So I just want to stop on that particular point for a minute. There was a rule that came out from the IRS. It's been a long time ago now. I feel like it's about 10 years somewhere in that time frame, that the IRS essentially ruled that it is not necessary for an employer to report the sale of, of non-qualified options on a 1099-B. They don't have to do it. And I have clients that it's never done, and it's irritating when it's not done because I'm always worried that there's one out there that I'm not seeing. They should have a 1099-B, but it didn't get issued, and so there isn't one. And if there isn't one, there's nothing I need to do. But if there is one, then we have to do the 8949. So I see a question from Amanda Cooley. If the 1099B shows that the basis was not reported to the IRS and it does show a cost basis, how do you show that on 8949? Oh, okay. Well, there's another line here. You see here it says short-term transactions reported on Form 1099B showing basis was not reported to the IRS. So it could be that the brokerage house has issued a 1099B where basis was not reported to the IRS, but you know what the basis is. In that situation, interestingly, you would enter the actual true basis in column E. You would not enter the incorrect basis in column E and then do an adjustment. The adjustment is only done when you check box 1A. If you check box D or C, you enter the true and actual cost in column E and go with that. And then the IRS knows that they're not looking for a basis on a 1099B because you've checked box B. Okay. So let's move down to, oh, this final statement. Yeah, I like this one. Cashless transactions, comprehensive illustration part three. Okay, so we're still continuing on with tech employee. Obtaining a year-end breakdown of a taxpayer's W-2 income is useful for purposes of balancing the 1099-B to the tax return. And you can use the year-end payroll summary to do this. And so my client that I based this illustration on had such a pay stub, and I used it to finally summarize everything up. And so on his pay stub, he showed that his base salary is $53,000. There was vacation pay, sick pay, and what's this, RSU? <laughs> I haven't even talked about that yet. And this employee obviously had some RSUs. Well, what about them? Well, RSUs are only going to matter when he sells, and we can work from the presumption that in this situation he didn't sell his RSUs. 
but he did sell his ESPPs and he did sell NQOs, and that's where you see these numbers being added in right here. $2,103 for the ESPP and $20,991 for the NQO. We also see that the deductions are going on for the 401k and the life insurance. And ultimately, if we take the total pay of $78,224 and subtract out the 2000 that is this number right here, 210379, you're going to get 76,121, and that is the amount that's going to be reported as Social Security wages. And then the payroll wages are going to be 70,000 minus the 401k deferral. So you take this gross amount up here of 78,224, subtract out the 401k deferral, and that's how you get $70,000. So again, if you're head is a little bit spinny after that. That's totally fine. Spend some time studying it on your own after class is over, and I think it will come together better. So the next topic we're going to look at now is restricted stock. And in most cases, if you receive property for services, you must include its fair market value in your income in the year you receive the property. However, if you receive the stock or other property that has certain restrictions that affect its value, you do not include the value of that property in your income until it has become substantially vested. You can choose to include the value in your income in the year it is transferred to you, as discussed later, rather than the year it is substantially vested. So until the property becomes substantially vested, it is owned by the person who makes the transfer to you, and this is usually your employer. However, any income from the property or the right to use the property is included in your income as additional compensation in the year you receive income or have the right to use the property. When the property becomes substantially vested, you must include its fair market value minus any amount you paid for it in your income for that year. Your holding period for this property begins when the property becomes substantially vested, and this part of the course is going to examine the tax treatment that applies to two primary ways that employers award restricted stock to their employees. The first is under a restricted stock award program, which is fairly unusual and not a common thing at all. And the second is under the restricted stock unit program, which I see all the time. So let's talk about the rarer animal first, the restricted stock award. Restricted stock awards are a method by which companies reward employees with stock, but retain the right to force the return of the stock if an employee does not meet certain preset requirements. With RSAs, a company awards an employee a number of shares of the company's stock subject to vesting restrictions, such as a requirement that the employee remain at the company for one year before the award vests. There are some important RSA facts to be aware of, and they include that the employee becomes the owner of the shares before they are vested and is entitled to vote and receive dividends on those shares. If the shares don't vest, the company has the right to cancel the award and take the shares back. The vesting of the RSA typically creates a taxable event for the employee who must either provide outside cash to pay taxes owed on the transfer or sell some of the shares back to the company or on the market. The employee will then own the remaining shares. Often when this happens, the company will gross up wages with additional compensation to cover the tax consequences. The employee's interest in the RSIs are aligned with other shareholders so that when the company's stock price goes down, the employee suffers along with the company's other shareholders. Let's talk about RSAs and founder stock because really, if you do run across an RSA situation, it is likely because you are dealing with founder stock because quite frankly, in the situation of founder stock, it's a no-brainer. It's a good idea to do it. So RSAs are popular with startup companies because they allow a corporation to award stock for the performance of future services by founders of the corporation. If one or more founders fails to perform the agreed upon services, then the restricted stock is forfeited and the remaining founders who do fulfill the terms of their agreement are not forced to share ownership with others that do not. Under the default rules for restricted stock, a founder or employee who becomes fully vested in restricted stock must pay taxes based upon the value of the stock at the time of the vesting and must continue to report income based on increased value in the stock. Thus, if stock is granted and then vests at different dates while going up in value, you're going to be required to pay tax whenever shares are vested to you. Here is an example of what I mean, and you can see that it could be a big ouch in the pocketbook of a particular employee. And in this situation, we have restricted stock award is granted and then vested over a two-year period. Tiffany is a 10% founder in the startup corporation Silver Inc. 
Her vesting schedule will award her 10% ownership share to her over a two-year period, and she purchased the stock for $100 per share on January 1 of year one. On December 1 of year one, Silver Inc. lands a valuable contract, and the value of its stock rises to $10 million, bringing Tiffany's share value to $1 million when 50% of her shares become invested. Tiffany will be required to include $500,000 in her income on the vest date and will be taxed at ordinary income rates, which could be as high as 39.6% federally, with additional amounts owed to the state and obviously for payroll tax purposes. At the end of year two, Tiffany becomes invested in the remaining 50% of the shares when their value is now $20 million, and that's going to force her to include another million dollars in her income on the second vesting. Now, we might be going, boo-hoo, poor Tiffany. She's now got stock that's worth $2 million. Well, the thing is, she hasn't got any money. She's been given stock that's worth all this money, but she hasn't sold it, so she doesn't have the money from it. So what's the girl to do? <laughs> well, on each of the vest dates, Tiffany must include this phantom income on her tax return, and the income is triggered by the value of the stock going up, even if she doesn't sell her shares. Coming up with the ta- cash to pay the taxes may be difficult unless she can sell some of the shares to pay the taxes she owes. And then, of course, she will no longer be a 10% shareholder. She'll be something less than that, probably possibly a lot less than a 10% shareholder. So how do you get out of this dilemma? Is there a way out? And the answer is yes, there is. It's called a Section 83B election. And IRS procedures allow a person who receives restricted stock in connection with the performance of services to include the value of property and income as compensation at the grant date rather than when the shares become vested. This election is made under Section 83B and must be made within 30 days of the grant date. Where a Section 83B election is properly made, a person will include the value of the transferred property in income in the year the property is granted. And if the property is included in income on the grant date, then no income will be recognized on the vesting date. So that's interesting. Let's see how that it would work. I made another illustration for you here. And here we have a comparison of a Section 83B election versus no Section 83B election when the stock is granted at a penny per share. So we have Jody who is an employee of Kid Inc. And he received 100,000 shares of Kid Inc. stock subject to vesting. On the grant date, the shares were worth a penny. After meeting the terms of his employment agreement, the shares became vested to Jody when they had a fair market value of a dollar per share. Jody sold the shares two years later for $5 per share. Assuming that Jody's federal tax rate is 39.6% and his capital gain rate is 20%, let's see what we can do with this information. In situation number one, we're going to have Jody make a Section 83B election when the share value is a penny. Within 30 days of receiving the grant for 100,000 shares, Jody made a Section 83B election by filing a statement with the IRS. On the grant date, the shares were worth $1,000. That's 100,000 times a penny. Jody included $1,000 in his income and paid ordinary income tax of $396. That's $1,000 times 39.6%. Because he filed a Section 83B election, Jody does not have to pay tax when the stock vests. He will report income from the grant only when he sells the stock. Because Jody sold the stock more than a year after the date of the grant, he will recognize a taxable gain of $4.99 per share. That's $5 minus the penny previously reported on the grant date. Jody will report $499,000 as capital gain income on his tax return, and his tax owed from the sale will be $99,800, or 20% of $499,000. The total tax that Jody pays in this situation will be taxes paid at vesting, $396, and taxes paid on the sale, $99,800. The total tax he will have paid is $100,196, so his realized income after tax will be $399,804. So let's take the same information but assume Jody does not make a Section 83B election. If Jody does not make a Section 83B election, he will not include an income amount on his return for the year he receives the grant. However, he will be required to include 100000 in his income when the shares become vested to him. Assuming he is still in the 39.6% bracket, and because he is holding the shares for more than one year, Jody will be required to pay $39,600 of tax when the shares are vested to him. And that means he's going to have to come up with $39,600 to pay the tax. Two years later, when Jody sells the stock, he will recognize a capital gain of $4 per share, which will be the $5 per share selling price 
minus the dollar per share previously reported in his income. Jody's total capital gain from the sale is going to be $400,000, and his tax liability will be 20% of that amount, or $80,000. So the total tax paid under situation number two is $119,600, and his realized income after paying his taxes is $380,500. So let's just look at the conclusion we have here. By filing an 83B election, Jody will save $19,404 of tax. In addition, he will have two other benefits that he will receive because of the election. Firstly, he will not have to pay $39,600 of tax on the vest date, which his cash he may not have. But also, his holding period is now going to begin on the grant date rather than the vest date. And as a result, he is considered to have held a stock long term one year and one day after the grant date instead of one year and one day after the vest date. Let's move on to illustration B, where we have a section 83B election for stock granted a dollar per share, but then the shares drop in value. So an 83B election sounds like it's a good deal, but only really if the stock doesn't drop in value. So what happens if it does? So making a Section 83B election can be beneficial for some taxpayers, but not for others. In the illustration we just looked at, Jody received a share grant at a cost of a penny per share, and it makes sense for him to, to make that election because he's only going to pay $396 in tax. However, the situation would be quite different if those same 100,000 shares were worth a dollar per share on the grant date and then dropped in value, as we're going to show in the next illustration. And here we have Jody makes a Section 83B election when the share value is a dollar. Within 30 days of receiving a grant for 100,000 shares valued at a dollar per share, Jody made a Section 83B election by filing a statement with the IRS. When the shares became vested to him, they had a value of 50 cents per share. And after holding the shares long term, he sold, sold the stock for 10 cents per share. On the grant date, the shares were worth 100000 and Jody included 100000 in his income and paid ordinary taxes of $39,600. One year later, when Jody became fully vested in the shares, they were worth $0.50 cents per share. If Jody had waited until the vest date to include the value of the shares in his income, he would only have needed to report tax on $50,000 and pay $19,800 in tax. One year later, Jody's stock has further declined in value, and he is concerned that the company is going to go out of business. He decides to sell the stock when it is trading at $0.10 cents per share. He will recognize a loss of $0.90 cents per share, which is the dollar he paid minus the sales price of $0.10. Cents. And he will report that $90,000 as a capital loss on his tax return. But he will only be allowed to deduct $3,000 of loss unless he has other capital gain income to offset the loss. So conclusion, filing an 83B election requires strict adherence to the 30-day filing deadline and a bunch of other rules, and it can be a good deal if you're able to acquire the stock for next to nothing. But if you're dealing with a company that has volatility in its value or uncertainty in its future, making a Section 83B election may, na may not be in your best interest. Now, the IRS does not have a Section 83B form. You really are just supposed to follow the instructions and guidelines that they lay out and you can go read those on this particular – actually, this is not it. There does have a site where you can go learn about the provisions of Section 83B, and they're pages and pages and pages long in legal speak that's difficult to understand. But there are other entities out there on the Internet who do a good job of putting it all into simple language for you, and that's what I've got here is a link to a Fidelity document. And Fidelity has taken the rules relating to a Section 83B election and created a form that you can just simply copy and use. And what it says is to make an 83B election, you must complete the following steps within 30 days of your award. Complete the IRS 83B form that is being provided to you. Mail the completed form to the IRS within 30 days of your award date and mail to the IRS Service Center where you file your taxes. And then mail a copy of the completed form to your employer. You must also attach a copy of the completed and filed form to your tax return when you file your income taxes for the year where the election is made. And so it's got some instructions on how to fill out the form. And then on the next page, we actually go to the form. And you can see it's saying, Dear Sir or Madam, I make an election pursuant to Section 83B. And then you go through and fill out all of the information and then sign it. And then the next page that was provided by Fidelity is a list of mailing addresses of where you'd send it in depending on where you normally file your return. So that's Restricted Stock Awards. Let's talk about RSUs next. Restricted Stock Awards are the common one. I see them all the time. I can't say every day, but a lot of days of the tax season I'm dealing with RSUs.
Restricted stock awards, or stock units rather, are a form of compensation used by companies to reward employees who provide certain services or reach certain milestones. RSUs have increased in popularity in recent years as many companies move away from stock options, those NQOs, in favor of RSUs. An employee who is awarded an RSU obtains a right to receive shares of stock when the RSUs become vested. And then upon vesting, the company issues the shares and the recipient becomes a shareholder. RSUs are different than RSAs because the employee does not receive ownership of the stock until it is vested, and most large companies like RSU programs because they are easier to administer, and they also ensure that employees are only entitled to dividends and voting rights on shares once they have vested. If you receive your stock or other property that has certain restrictions that affect its value, you do not include the value of the property in your income until it has been substantially vested. But just as with RSAs, you can still make an 83B election with RSUs. I just never see it done for all the reasons I just described. Until an RSU becomes substantially vested, it is not owned by you and continues to be the property of your employer. When the property becomes substantially vested, you will include the fair market value minus any amount you paid for it in your income for the year. Your holding period for this property begins when the property becomes substantially vested. Well, the deal is that when I see RSUs, there really is no purchase that ever goes on for the employee. Unlike ESPPs where they're putting money into a pool And then at the end of that offering period, the pool of money is used to buy shares at a discount. And unlike NQOs where the employee says, well, you have a right to purchase stock at this particular discounted price beginning on XYZ date, and you wait for a point in time where you want to exercise it, you make a decision to purchase. Both of those are acts by the employee to make a purchase, and that purchase is actually recorded and is reported on the 1099-B. So with RSUs, the employee never actually purchases stock. What happens is the employer is saying, hey there, Joe, if you work for us to the end of this particular contract period, say a year, at the end of the year, we're going to give you 100 shares. And the employee says, cool. The employee doesn't actually know what those shares are going to be worth when they're given to him. He just knows that if he hangs it out and toughs it out for a year, he's going to be able to get them. And so RSUs are really another form of receiving a bonus paycheck. But there's no action done by the employee to exercise the options or to purchase the options. They're just vested at a particular point in time. So when that vesting occurs, wages are obviously at issue here. And all of the amount that's given to the employee is going to be compensation for services rendered, and all of the amount of the value of those stock is included in the employee's pay. Well, if you're dealing with a substantial sum of money, how is the employee going to pay the tax on that? And so what normally happens is the employer will withhold a portion of the stock and use that portion withheld to pay the taxes and give the employee what's left. So the employer may say, I'm going to award you 100 shares if you tough it out for a year. But when the end of the year comes, you actually receive 50 shares. And the reason you receive 50 is the other 50 went to pay the taxes. So when do RSUs vest? Well, depending on your company plan rules, vesting requirements may be met either by the passage of time or company or employee performance. If an employee does not meet the requirements set forth by the employer prior to the end of the vesting period, the units are typically forfeited to the company. Some companies may allow a vesting prior to the vesting date, contingent upon the company satisfaction of a particular employee's compliance with criteria set forth in company plan rules. So what happens to the RSUs once they vest? Well, once RSUs vest, an employee's right to vested stock units becomes non-forfeitable, and at vesting, the employee will receive an actual payment according to the distribution schedule under the company's plan. In some cases, an employee may elect to defer the distribution, and if an employee does not elect to defer the distribution, then the distribution date and the vesting date are the same. So tax payments are due at vesting, and there are two different ways that employees can choose to pay taxes at vesting. One is net shares, which I just described to you earlier, the employer withholds some of the shares. And the other is option two, pay cash. And in option two, the employee is going to have to come up with enough cash to pay the tax that they owe, turn it over to the employer so that the employer can then pay the payroll tax obligations on it. So here we have a net share example. Ralph had 100 RSUs that were vested to him by his employer on April 1st, and the market price of the stock on that date was $60, and his combined income tax and payroll withholding was 40%. Ralph's employer will include the following amount on his W-2. 100 shares times $60 a share is $6,000. But Ralph's employer is going to have to sell 40 of the shares to pay the withholding that Ralph owes on the RSUs. 
So 40 at $60 a share is $2,400. Ralph will receive a year-end W-2 that will show his Box 1 wages were increased by $6,000. And actually, Box 3 and 5, Social Security and Medicare, will also be increased. And he'll also see that $2,400 has been allocated as withholding in Box 2 of his W-2. He is going to be left holding 60 shares, and the cost basis in the remaining 60 shares is $60 per share. And if and when he sells these shares, the amount that's going to show up on the 1099B is actually going to be a cost basis of $60 per share. So although ESPPs and NQOs have a different number, a number that reflects only the purchase price being reflected on the 1099B, in the case of RSUs, you're going to see the fair market value that was included in their income reported on the 1099B. Example number two, pay cash. Sydney had 100 RSUs vested to her by her employer on June 1. The market price of the stock on that day was $40, and the combined income and payroll tax withholding rate is 40%. The total amount at vesting is $4,000, and the tax withholdings owed is 40% of $4,000 or $1,600. Sydney decides that she's going to come to the table with $1,600 and give it to her employer, and when she does that, her box one wages will be increased by $4,000 and the withholdings will be increased by the $1,600 that she gives to her employer. And Sydney now owns all 100 shares and her cost basis in those 100 shares is the $4,000. So other reporting requirements affecting RSUs, well, they vary and are reported only usually on the W-2. You're not going to be looking for a 3922. You're not going to be looking for a 3921. You're not going to be looking for a code V on W-2 anywhere. Really, the only way that you even know that there are RSUs is when you start having a discussion with the employee and start looking at all of the documentation that employee has managed to bring forward. Ultimately, when you finally figure out that you're dealing with an RSU, you're probably going to determine that the reporting of basis on the 1099B is correct and all the effort was for nothing. <laughs> but because you have an employee, say, working for Intel who has exercised NQOs, ESPPs, and RSUs all in the same year, how can you tell whether which Intel stock it is that was sold and was the basis reported correct or not? How can you tell? It becomes a nightmare. Ultimately, you can go to bigcharts.com and look up the trade price of that particular company's stock on the date that it shows its acquisition date. And if the price per share is less than that, then that could tell you that you're dealing with an NQO or an ESPP. But other than that, it's difficult. All right, so that concludes today's class on determining the basis in employee stock purchase plans. Following on the pages afterwards is a quick reference guide that summarizes some of the rules on, kind of on a quick cheat sheet for you. One of my staff people put that together. And then after this, I have a classwork assignment. And I know some of you probably have to run, so I'm going to give you the second password of the day. But those of you who want to see another rundown, can hang with me and I will go over the problems and then show you some answer keys for them. Password number two is Calgary, C-A-L-G-A-R-Y, Calgary. All right, so I'm going to quickly go over the classwork assignments and those of you who need to run, go ahead and run and those of you who want to stay a bit late for about 10 minutes, I'm going to go over a couple of classwork assignments that I threw together to give you more opportunity to see how all these numbers come together. So what we're going to do for our classwork assignment is calculate the cost basis, wage income, and capital gain for each of the following sales. Assume gross up has occurred on each employee's W-2 as is required under the payroll reporting rules. And in classwork assignment number one, we have a qualifying ESPP sale. Seska is granted 200 Nistrum stock ESPP shares at $50 per share. And the fair market value on that grant date is $58 per share. She then purchases the shares on 110 of 13 when they are trading for $61 a share, and then she sells the shares on 823 of 14 for $65 a share. So what is Seska's basis in her shares? How much will she report as wage income? And how much will she report as capital gain income? And I've given you a copy of her 3922, and I've also given you a copy of her 1099B. So just take a few minutes to think your way through that, and then I'll pull up the answer key. You can just type those in the chat box. 
when you have them. Okay, so here is the answer key for our first assignment, Classwork 1, that involved SESCA. Now, for it to be a qualifying ESPP sale, the stock must have been held more than two years after the grant date and more than one year after the exercise date, and she's met both of those criteria, so this is a qualifying sale. And therefore, when we figure the spread or the amount that's going to be included as wage income, we're going to take the difference between the grant price and the fair market value on the date of the grant. And in this case, we're going to have $58 is the grant price. We're going to multiply that by 200 shares and we get $11,600. So that's going to be the amount that she pays for the stock. For the qualifying ESPP sale, the difference between the grant price and the fair market value on the date of the grant is the amount that's going to have to be reported as wage income. And that difference is, of course, an $8 discount. So $8 a share times 200 shares is $1,600, and that is the amount that's going to be included on SESCA's W-2. And then finally, figuring out what her cost basis is. So the capital gain is the final question, and the ultimate answer is $1,400, but I want to show you how we get that. So question number three is how much capital gain income is she going to report, and it's going to be $1,400. So she's going to take the grant price of $58 per share, She's going to figure that she is the eight dollars is the difference between the grant price and the fair market value of the date on the grant. So she's going to take that difference and add that in. Ultimately, her cost basis is eleven thousand six hundred dollars. But the thing is, the amount that's getting included on her W two is not being reflected on the ten ninety nine B. So when we go into the 8949, we're going to show that the gross proceeds from the sale are 13000 but that the cost basis on the 1099B is 10000 And the adjustment to basis is $1,600 because that's the amount that's going to be included in her wage income. And that leaves her with a net capital gain of $1,400. Going back to Seska's sale, she has a grant of 200 Nistrum stock when the shares are $50 a share. The fair market value on the grant date is $58 per share. So the fair market value on the grant date is $58. The exercise price is $50. The difference between those two numbers is $8. And that is the amount that is going to be bumped up into her wage income. So 8 times 200, $1,600 is the amount she's going to be reporting as wage income. How much is her basis in her shares? Well, the basis in her shares is going to be $58 a share. If you take $58 a share and multiply that out by 200 shares, that's where you're going to get the basis amount that we show here of $11,600. And so that basis, of course, is higher than the amount that she paid for the shares. And so the difference between what she paid for the shares and the amount that was grossed up in her W-2, $1,600, is entered in column G, and that leaves her with a net capital gain of $1,400. So moving on with the second classwork assignment that we have, Classwork assignment number two, we have a non-qualifying ESPP sale. And in this assignment, we have Harry, who is granted 100 shares of Voyager, Inc. And the ESPP shares on 713 of 12 were granted for $40 a share when the fair market value on this date was $50 per share. So we can see that the exercise price he's paying is $40, but the fair market value per share on the grant date is $50. He exercises the shares on 120 of 13 when they are trading for $61 a share, and he sells the shares on 423 of 14 for $70 per share. So how much is his basis in the shares? Well, his basis is going to be the spread or difference that is included in his income plus the amount he paid for the shares. Ultimately, his basis is going to be $50 per share times 100 shares. The answer to four would be $5,000. How much is going to be reported in his income as wages? Well, it's going to be the spread or difference of $10 a share multiplied by $100 a share. So that would be $1,000. And then how much will Harry report as capital gain income? Well, it's going to be the difference between what his cost is, which is $50 a share, and what he sells it for, which is $70 per share. So that's a $20 difference, and that would be a $2,000 profit that is going to get reported on his tax return. So this is a disqualifying disposition because he doesn't meet the holding repair requirements. So he's going to go at the difference between $40 per share, which is exercise price, and the fair market value per share on the exercise date. So the spread here is $21, and 21 times 100 is 2100 So his basis in the shares is going to be the fair market value per share on the exercise date, or $6,100. Then we move on to the next question. How much will Harry report as wage income? He's going to report as wage income the difference between these two numbers times $100, or $2,100, and how much will he report as capital gain income? Well, it's going to be $6,100 
subtracted from $7,000, and we can see here that the cost basis reported to IRS is $4,000. The sales proceeds are $7,000, and so we're obviously going to have to make an adjustment on his um, $8,949 to account for that. So again, back, his cost basis is $6,100 a share. The amount being reported as wage income is $2,100 a share. $6,100 from $7,000 is a $900 profit. So how will that look on the $8,949? Well, in this case, it is a long-term transaction. We go down to line one of part two of $8,949. We describe the shares that were sold. We enter the sales proceeds. We show $4,000 as the basis reported to IRS. We enter a code B to show that there's, the basis is incorrect and that the true basis is a $2,100 increase in cost or a $2,100 decrease to the profit, and the net result is that $900 of profit being reported on the 8949 and carrying the Schedule D. So that's it. Thank you for participating in today's class, and I hope to see you again soon. Bye-bye. We hope you've enjoyed this tax education class. Pacific Northwest Tax School is approved as a CE provider by the IRS and the states of Oregon, New York, and Texas. We have been awarded the Quality Assurance Standard by NASBA and meet the CE requirements for CPAs in most U.S. states and territories. Tax clients demand knowledge and experience. Pacific Northwest Tax School provides the in-depth, practical education needed to improve your understanding of tax law and to meet the demands of the competitive tax preparation industry.